will work. Brilliant. So, uh, so I'm I'm really excited about this session because you, you know you hear about Amazon and their customer obsession and about working in teams no more than the size of being able to be fed by two pizzas and this is kind of all part of their innovation culture really. So really pleased to introduce Alex Holmes from Amazon AWS who's going to talk to us about forming a culture of innovation. Over to you, Alex. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. And I'm uh, really excited to be talking at Digital Fest today. Uh, it's like a great concept and I've been watching all the buzz and things on Twitter, so I'm really glad that I can be part of it. Um, so as they said, my name is Alex Holmes. I'm a senior manager of government transformation in AWS Amazon Web Services, which is part of Amazon, which I will talk a lot about in a second. Uh, I've been in AWS about 18 months, and actually before that I came from the UK government. I was most recently in um, DCMS, where I worked on cybersecurity policy, and funnily enough on a thing called Cyber First, which you uh, may have seen some adverts about recently. Um, and before that I spent a lot of time in the government digital service, where I can safely say actually um, the public sector does apply a lot of the things I'll be talking about today, but sometimes I think in the public sector we don't talk about them enough and we're not bold enough to uh, see how innovative um, we can be. Uh, so without further ado, uh, so in Amazon, uh, our mission, our top statement is to be the Earth's most customer centric company. And we very deliberately say the Earth's, not the world's, so sort of, I think, to really set that level of ambition. And hopefully, if you've used Amazon, if you use Amazon, you, you feel that and you see that. So uh, sometimes I'll be talking about uh, my experience as an employee of Amazon, but other times I'll be talking about as a customer. And one of my first experiences of Amazon was how easy the company made it to return items. Um, and it's that always, always that surprise of it was never, you know, questions and doubt and you had to prove something wasn't working. It was print of a label, slap it back on and send it back. And they they really always work backwards from the customer. And that customer obsession is something that comes through lots and lots. And to be innovative, that as Lisa said, the way we do that is we always start with the customer and work backwards. Now, when I was in government, you know, we'd always talk about starting with user needs. And this sort of customer obsession actually is one of the reasons I came to Amazon. For me, it felt like one of the areas had the greatest alignment to what I was doing in the public sector, that sort of, you know, working to, working for the citizens, for businesses, uh, working from the needs and working backwards rather than doing technology for technology's sake. And what the way Jeff puts it is, when you work backwards from the customer, because you're always trying to please them and think of new ways of, of improving things, that's how you get, that's how you invent and that's how you innovate. And he often describes it as, if you ask people, um, is this good, is this, you know, is this cheap enough? Generally people say yes. Um, and again, in government, I remember like when we had, with the technology, we sort of, we were a victim of our own sort of lack of, of uh, high standards. We always thought, you know, the technology was okay. Um, just look back a year in the sort of video conferencing facilities we often use anywhere, uh, private or public sector, and we would always say, oh, isn't it great? You can, you know, talk to someone, you know, with a sort of blurry video. And, and now we have higher standards. We, we didn't realise it wasn't good enough. And the same, of course, is true in retail. So before, uh, and there's a really good story here about Amazon Prime. So before Amazon Prime, there was this uh, free super super saver delivery and Amazon was really proud of it because it was free delivery but it was quite complex to get you had to spend more than 25 pounds and ultimately what you said is it was like no rush so you could arrive in a few weeks and there was this idea of this thing called Amazon Prime where you would get free two-day delivery as it was then uh, for a sort of set fee and initially when it was touted people challenged the people who came up with the idea and challenged Jeff as well and said um, this is probably couldn't bankrupt the business it's like there's no way this is ever going to work um, like the level of standards all our systems have to be retrofitted and rebuilt to be able to fulfill and do the logistics that could stand this up now of course Amazon Prime has been massively successful and in addition to that 
uh, what was free two day delivery then free one day delivery and here in, in, in London and other urban centres it's free two hour delivery you get lots of other benefits of being a member. I mean, today there's the sort of the big discount day, but I, the things I find more interesting is the whole sort of um, Amazon Studios, you know, Prime um, Prime Movies. Uh, so you can watch, you know, watch all these things where ultimately was a, a free delivery service. And similarly in AWS, so AWS started as, you know, a thing for cloud computing around compute and storage. And now we have well over 180 services and most of those and actually including features, there's over 2000 features on those those services. And most of those features and services aren't because, oh, we had a good idea. It was also because we worked out what customers were trying to describe to us. Um, Serverless computing, Lambda is a really good example for that. No one sort of specifically said, oh, we really need a way of managing our uh, compute without, uh, you know, spinning up servers. But we worked out that if they could manage computing by just by using code, that would make so much so things so much easier. And therefore then, you know, out of that came serverless computing, another big invention from Amazon. And the other great thing about customer obsession is it doesn't really the things that customers really want don't really change over time. So customers always want things quicker. They always want more convenience. Uh, they want things easier uh, and in, in, in retail they want it cheaper. So you can always work backwards from those things and always innovate to those needs. And what does that innovation look like? I've talked about AWS and how actually gone from going a bookshop, going to CDs and DVDs, that doesn't feel like a giant leap, but then going to be a sort of utility computing provider um, that made a massive difference where we were actually were inventing for ourselves to deliver better services to customers and we realized it could be something for other people. And um, then obviously Kindle, um, Alexa and Echo, those, those devices. And more recently, the thing I find really exciting is Amazon Go, which um, what I've read in the papers is coming to the UK soon and I've had a chance to go into one of these and it it's one of those things where I've always thought that modern technology was you know going around the store scanning your own items and for me this is like the future so once you're registered you walk in uh, scanning your phone and just take things off the shelves put them in your bag and just literally walk out there's no queuing no scanning just take stuff off the shelves and walk out down to put it in your bag and it knows what you've taken if you put it back if you've got a family and your children taking random things off it also works that out and you all put it back and it's all driven by AI and cameras in the store um, it feels like the future and then recently we announced Amazon one where once you're registered you, you don't need your phone you don't need any devices to go into the store you just wave your hand over the uh, the entrance then that's it. That's the only interaction. You just take things off the shelves and walk out. That's all you need to do. And for me, uh, no one really ever asked for that, but it delights people and people love it. So that innovation I've just talked about, what, how do we get there? What are the things uh, you can do? Uh, now, these are all things that have worked for us and what we do. That we do not have, we do not own the IP on innovation. There are lots of other people have great ideas. I'm not saying this is the best way. This is what we do and what works for us. And you know, anyone else can take it and use it as they feel free. So the first thing, and I think probably the most important thing is is having the right culture. Um, and again, I've already talked about customer obsession, but our culture is built around our 14 leadership principles. Um, we're always higher on these principles. We always hire based on competency based questions. We don't do trick questions trying to catch people out about uh, like why manhole covers round or what would be the best shaped rock to throw. None of that. It's always about data and competency based. Uh, all our promotions are based on these principles as well. It is our culture, our values um, and how we recognize performance. And I'll, I'll talk a few about a few of them now. Also, you may notice in the bottom of the screen, it says, unless you know better ones. And actually, it's just a, a phrase I'd never really it's sort of it came. It comes up a lot when you join Amazon and on everything we do, we always sort of add this and say nothing's fixed. If anyone has a better idea, we will change it. And these were changed a few years ago. And I'll talk about how unless you know better ones can be turned into action. So the first principle is about inventing and simp invent and simplify. And the important part of this is, <coughs> excuse me. 
<coughs> I went down the wrong way. Oh, sorry, Alex. <coughs> have, a, have a good cough. Turn your mic off and have a good cough. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, I was just giving you all a chance to read it. Uh, <laughs> so the, the really important thing here is um, as we do things, when you're really innovating and inventing, you you have to stick with it and you may be misunderstood for long periods of time uh, and that's OK. And we've done this as well. So here you have the Kindle. Uh, on the left is the Kindle White, which is probably what you're more familiar with today. But on the right is what it initially looked like. And it's a pretty clunky device. And I had an early version, not as early as this, but it had a keyboard on it. And it's, I don't know why we ever thought we, you'd need a keyboard to read books. I think they, you know, there's a browser in it and things as well. And these were mistakes and we learned from those mistakes, but Amazon stuck with the idea of Kindle, you know, and now people love it and it continues to improve. And actually the thing I love about my, in more recent version is the sort of anti glare thing, which um, makes it a real pleasure to read. And of course, if AWS, this was, um, this was the same thing. When, when they first moved into cloud computing, everyone questioned this. You know, cloud computing was a completely new thing. Uh, it was a massive investment. No one really believed it would uh, ever work. We're going up against a whole new market. And then since then, we've got continually better at it. Uh, you know, the price of, of it has continued to reduce because we've got those economies of scale. So I've mentioned um, it's now um, over extra, uh, over 2000 services we're adding to it. It's, you know, continually growing, continuing getting better. And, you know, despite the skepticism, I think you know, the bet has been proven right. Um, and actually what's even better than that is not only is it a, a way of doing innovation for ourselves, it's actually completely revolutionized the sort of technology and uh, startup ecosystem. Because before, if you had a startup, you need capital investment to, you know, buy those servers, you know, spin up those servers, actually buy them, provision them, and, you know, there would be a million dollars before you'd get anywhere. And now, as a startup, you can actually start up with negative capital because you can get credits free with Amazon, AWS or other cloud service providers to start technology. And what that's meant is we've re massively reduced the cost of innovation because that whole kind of tech idea of fail fast has become a reality. It's very easy to create an app and build things now because you don't have that capital investment. And it's exactly the same thing is true in public sector and elsewhere. It's much easier to try things, to build new services very quickly, um, test them and see if they work. I know shut them off if you need and you only pay for what you use. Um, it's, in, you know, it, being able to leverage things which already exist and focus on what you care about, you know, user needs, better public services is where, you know, another great way of getting innovation. And this concept of uh, experimenting and trying things and failing, I'll keep coming back to. And one of our other principles is bias for action. And coming from the public sector, I, I appreciate the sort of, you know, sometimes in the public sector, we, we have this sort of risk aversion, but, you know, we, we, we don't, you know, risk is a thing that needs to be managed in any sector. And I think what Amazon realized is decisions are often when it's a two way, there's two way door decisions and one way door decisions. And what I mean by that is when it's a two way door decision, it's very low risk because there's a low cost of failure and you can go back through the door. And things like cloud computing mean it just reduces the cost of failure, therefore reduces the risk and makes it more of a two way door decision. But of course, there are one way door decisions where you do need to have make sure you have lots of data, lots of evidence, because once you've made a decision, you can't really go back. And of course, you know, like anywhere, we, we still do business cases and things when we're investing large amounts of money. But the other way you can help with those two way doors is is your, and you want to increase innovation, is is your governance actually helping innovation or is it stifling it? Are you cr putting in place things which are one-way doors where really they're two-way doors? And sorry, that's a lot of jargon, but are you putting in place lots of approvals where really actually there's low risk and you just want to, you should empower the team to be able to make the decision and take that bias for action themselves? So, 
uh, that's a culture. And then in Amazon, we have a thing called uh, mechanisms as well. And this is how we sort of make sure encode those behaviors and make sure they're in place. And a good example of an and on cord, uh, sorry, a mechanism, I've given the answer away, is um, all of us encouraged to spend time in contact center, our contact centers. Uh, like Jeff puts away time, you know, everyone is encouraged and you sit there uh, with the person taking the calls and AWS would do it from the sort of AWS uh, support desk. And one time when Jeff was doing this, there was a, a call came in and the customer service representative um, saw the things coming up on the screen that and said, oh, I know what I know what this is going to be about. And, and Jeff said, well, how do you know? And the customer con person said, well, it's this uh, table. Everyone who gets this table, uh, the packaging doesn't quite work, so the table's always damaged. I bet when they call up, the table will be damaged, and it was. And Jeff said, "Well, why have you not been able to do anything about this? This is this isn't good. We need to take it off the site because it's not working. It's it's damaged. It's always damaged." And she said, "You know, I always try, and it's hard. And this is where this idea of mechanisms came from. That best endeavors." Everyone has best endeavors and we all mean well, but they don't make it easy for us to improve things. So we implemented a thing called the Andon Cord, which uh, has come from Japanese uh, Kaizen in the Toyota plant, where along the production line, if there was ever a fault anywhere in the line, someone could pull the Andon Cord and it would stop the whole production line so they could fix it, even if it's way up the production line and then improve everything rather than let uh, you know malfunctioning Toyotas go off the end. So for us, anyone in the cost customer contact center can delist any item on Amazon. And actually that's been rolled out. So anyone who's an employee of Amazon, if I see something and I think it's a fraudulent item or there's something wrong with it, I can pull the end on cord and delist it and then they investigate immediately, uh, which I, I have done and, and it's worked. Uh, so for me, that felt really empowering um, and great because it also stops something being sold that shouldn't have been sold. And one of my favorite mechanisms is what we call the working backwards process. So this is the process where we make sure we build in uh, sort of that customer obsession in everything we do. Uh, and there are certain artifacts uh, that come with that, and I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, um, and of course, one thing we, we always, I, I think it's worth saying is, and I really learned this in the public sector, and I think the public sector is excellent at this, is, need to think about who your customer is. And often your customer doesn't act like you and think like you and look like you, and they will have very specific contexts and very specific needs. And I think governments who've been able to respond really well uh, to COVID, who have, they've really understood this and were prepared to and able to respond very quickly to shifting needs of uh, people and the services. Um, and you know, so we start with you know some uh, some questions, which are really kind of user research questions that help people formulate uh, this concept. And here's some of the articles. For me, what's really great is so when someone has a new idea, they write the press release. They write the press release about what this item, this new service, will look like and feel like, and and the frequently asked questions behind it. Um, to you know, really challenge themselves and need to put visuals around it as well. And done well, this is an enormous amount of effort, but nothing ever gets produced unless we do this first. And it feeds and you know, it lives on and you put user research and things into it, but you make sure that we are always working backwards from the customer rather than building technology and trying to find a use for it. And many, many things don't go beyond this stage. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's, you know, you, only one in 10 ideas is a good idea. And actually, you know, many more of our sort of ideas here in Amazon, many more of our things will do a great uh, PR, what we call a PR FAQ, uh, that working backwards process, and it will get killed off at that stage just, just because um, it's not really delighted. We don't think it's going to delight customers. It's not going to be good enough for customers. Um, and of course, as it evolves, uh, you know, starting off sketching, uh, I learned policy again, I learned policy sketching uh, through things like the policy lab uh, in the UK government. But, you know, as it evolves, you know, it starts off a sketch and maybe architecture diagrams, and then you may build some minimal, uh, minimal uh, lovable products, we say, like a minimum viable product. And then you evolve from that and you build out um, 
before something is used. So you know, always working backwards from the customer. The other thing I think is really good when it comes to uh, our mechanisms is what we call docs. Uh, now, again, coming from the public sector, these are submissions. In central government, we just call these submissions. But it, what's amazing is um, here, nothing is done by a presentation. No decisions are made through PowerPoint. No decisions are made through uh, sort of having the best argument in the meeting. Everything is always done through documents. They always have to be less than uh, six pages long. Any extra information goes in an annex. And one of the things I read about before I joined Amazon, I thought it's just one of these kind of uh, myths, is that before every meeting, at start of every meeting, in fact, you spend up to 20 meetings reading the doc, uh, you put in your comments on online using our uh, in our system, and then you go through the comments and you and you discuss it. And we really do that every single meeting. Uh, there aren't snazzy presentations. We sit there in silence, read the document, and then come up and discuss. And often these documents to make decisions, they can easily go through uh, you know dozens of iterations with peers, and they're continually improved. And this is how we make our one-way door decisions: is with these docs backed with lots of data and evidence. And so the mechanisms, but then it wouldn't be an AWS talk if I wasn't uh, talking about some of the architecture that supports that. Now, for us. Um, all, you know, shift to microservices, you know, we, we run on AWS. AWS is sort of a thing we sell because we move to it um, and moving it to it enabled us to, as Amazon to scale. And there's a famous letter called the API letter where um, Jeff basically said that every time you build something, you have to maintain it and run it, and it has to be able to talk in a, like through machine language, through hardened APIs with other things. And it made us a very nimble, agile organization, despite delivering all these large things, because everything can talk to each other and everything is always maintained and, and delivered through um, business logic and data rather than big silos. And this kind of microservices architecture is basically the cloud and now what we sell to other people as well. And it also means that when you have an idea, one, there's this sort of underlying compute and storage you can use, but there's, there are other, other things you can just sort of leverage uh, on top. So you can almost build 80% of your solution before you have to do anything. And you can just focus on that customer facing bit. And the, the other, uh, one of the interesting things about this is sort of comes from the API letter is it really empowers teams because everything is is managed and serviced. Um, you have all these platforms that all these teams can use to build things with, and they're not gate. You know, there aren't gatekeepers on those. There aren't rules that you can't use them. They're always maintained, and when they get really popular, they get expanded out. And so um, we're using Microsoft Teams now, but we have our own service called Amazon Chime, which was literally uh, built as an internal video conferencing platform. We have a thing called Amazon Connect, which was, is basically all the technology behind our call centers, fully scalable virtual call centers, which we now sell because it was getting popular. Um, and actually lots of some of the things we release are all things which they were used internally. They got very popular internally. It's like, OK, maybe we should sell this and allow other people to use it as well. And that's how you get from just starting with just compute and storage in 2006 to well over 180 services. And I've talked about some of those things that further up the stack like Lambda and then there's sort of uh, more user facing things like Chime and we have uh, work docs. But I find some really exciting stuff, which, you know, in the AI space where you've got all the stuff to um, sort of you want to write your own algorithms. But then, of course, at the top end of that, um, in the same way, we're sort of allowing people to use our own things. You've got um, Lex and so Lex, which is the speech recognition part of Alexa and then Polly, which is the voice part of Alexa, you can use in your own things um, just because we've opened, you know, we've allowed other people to use that. So it's exactly the same way as leveraging things to get innovation on top of that. And with all these empowered teams, um, very technology heavy slide, but it means that um, we do 194 million deployments a year. Now, I can give you lots of examples where we've had big outsourcing contracts in UK government where we, you know, you'd lucky if you got a deployment a month. Um, 
because we have lots of deployments, we means we can mass continually improve everything we do and always make it better because we have those teams and they're empowered and they can, you know, write production code and make things better. And then finally, so how do we organize for all of these things? And uh, uh, Lisa kind of gave away some of this, but part of it is, uh, so I talked about the hire, the hiring at the beginning. Really, we, we hire people who are builders and we don't just mean coders and, and, and those kind of builders. Um, we want pe people who have ideas and want th to deliver those ideas and improve things. And then we let them do that. So I talked about uh, the PRFAQ process and the doc and that bit at the beginning where it says, unless you know better ones. Well, um, the idea of a doc is, so if you have an idea, if I had an idea to have a 15th leadership principle or something else that needed improving, I could write a doc, check it for my peers, and it could go all the way up and it just goes as far as it needs to for the decision to be made. And if it's something that needs Jeff to make the decision, that doc will go all the way to Jeff. And I actually have a colleague that's uh, had, had a doc that's got all the way to Jeff uh, and they improved something as a result. And, and that sort of built in um, ideas box is so much more powerful than an ideas box is. You have an idea, you, you get the data behind it and you and you can go off and it may end up being uh, spun out as a new service. Um, you know, I feel really empowered. Alex? And of, yes. Oh, 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 I've just, oh, shut up. I've just seen the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, because we're, we're at five o'clock now. I don't know if you'd noticed the time, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Not... I, um, I, sorry, I thought I had, to, uh, I, because we started, yeah, sorry, because we started. No, that's right, that's okay. Just, no, that's okay. Just letting you know. No, thank you. I will go quickly and I'll make sure I, I have, t if people can stay, I will answer any questions as well. Um, so Lisa talked about the two pizza teams and again, um, the idea is the teams are small decentralized and they are multidisciplinary so they can make their own decisions within the team. And the idea is when you can't feed a team with two pizzas, it's probably too big and actually you need to think about how you can split it off and then have all these other self-functioning teams as well. Um, I can't emphasize enough too much, uh, sorry, enough <laughs> emphasize too much this sort of idea of experimenting, experimenting early and frequently. And I've talked a lot about that. All these things are about making it easy and cheap to fail and so people can experiment more. And again, um, the idea of failure. So, you know, you, you have to un accept there will be failures. You want to minimize the cost of those failures and the risk of those failures because without, fa without failure, you're not going to get invention. And, you know, scientists know this. And then finally, you know, it wouldn't, I, I need to, you know, share our own failures. So I, I've never met anyone that ever bought a Fire Phone. It was a mass, it was a massive failure uh, and a bad one day, one way door decision. But actually from that, a lot of the technology that went into that we used in other things. So a lot of the technology actually ended up in Amazon uh, Alexa. Um, and some of the technology even made its way into Amazon Go stores. So some of the way where it could work out how far away a face is, I think, uh, is now being used in uh, Amazon Go stores. So, you know, we learned a lot from it and were able to reuse it. Similarly, um, Amazon auctions was a massive failure. eBay was better. Um, but we learned from that and we evolved it into Amazon Marketplace, which actually uh, a massively important part of Amazon where you allow, you know, you means that small businesses uh, don't need to create the, their own e-commerce platforms. They can use ours, they can use our own uh, logistics as well. So it makes it much easier for them to, to sell to customers and to grow. Um, often in competition with us, but we'd always point out to people where if you know something's cheaper from a, a small business on our site, we'll always point them to that and that's uh, Amazon Marketplace. So that is it for me. Uh, sorry if um, I've overrun slightly, um, but I'll just finish on a small quote from Big Jeff. Um, but it's for me, this important point is, you know, you, all the culture, all the mechanisms and things actually the best invention, the best innovation comes from empowering others, and making it easy for them to invent uh, and slightly American thing, you know, to pursue their dreams. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much, Alex. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. It's just no, it's okay. obviously I don't know how many slides left you've got to go. So it's just to give people an indication of when we're getting near, near the end. There were a couple of questions, um, if you if you don't mind, in the mm -hmm. chat that people had come up with. So, so there's one here around, does innovation mean that users don't know what they want until you give it to them? And how does that how does local government then adapt to that? That's a that's a really good question. So the short answer is um, no. I mean, you, you get really great inventions when you 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 think beyond uh, what people say they like and say what they want. And actually, I think in the public services context, the trick is to do what they. It's always to go back to what they need, what not what they want. They will say they want one thing, and actually, good user research really draws out the need, and sometimes people can't articulate that and finding the need and working out what need you're solving for I think is a really powerful thing in public services and I know um, you know that's the whole point of user research discipline and bringing that into government to to work backwards that's brilliant thank you and I I really love the one way and two way door decisions I think I might use that in in our um, team as well so <laughs> they can expect that there's Great. a few of them on the call. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for doing this session. I don't know whether you can see the chat, but there's already some um, good feedback coming in for you. Thank you to everybody who's attended today. If you want to know more about the festival, hashtag FutureFest or follow at Digital Dorset um, for more information. If, if you did want to, to hang on briefly to speak to Alex, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Um, otherwise, I'm going to wish you a lovely evening and close the first day of our festival. So thank you, everybody. Thank I feel you. like I need Thanks to do a little running. clap for now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And you can reach out to me on Twitter if you did have a want a question and didn't have time to ask it as well. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. There's lots of thank yous coming in. Great session. It was. There was so much in there. It was. Uh, it was brilliant. I can't wait to look back at the recording again. Actually, and watch it again. Oh, I need it to stop good. the recording. Thinking of yes. that. <laughs>